Hello, my name is Dr. Richard Anthony Baker, and I am the Assistant Vice Chancellor, Vice President for Equal Opportunity Services. I may have already provided an intro in a previous video. I'm just restating it for this slide. Welcome, everyone. Let's talk about uh, um, uh, this very important topic. Before I do, I want to make sure um, that I provide a warning for those where this topic, we're going to talk about uh, consent as it relates to sexual misconduct and some other issues related to our sexual misconduct policy may be a trigger for some um, and I completely understand this video is not meant to be a trigger but a way to keep us all safe as it relates to this particular activity um, this is something that is required by law so every university across America is presenting something similar uh, but I do understand if you do have a triggering, triggering event please make sure um, uh, uh, to uh, contact someone if you want to talk to someone you can pause the video um, if you have additional concerns you can contact me and my number is 713-743-8834 that's my direct number give me a call and um, and I can discuss with you the training. With that said, let's go ahead and jump into the talk. We call this particular training um, Cougs Get Consent, but we refer to it as the talk because in many um, circles, that's exactly what we have. We have the talk, sometimes with our parents, sometimes with others that are concerned about us, and that talk basically is uh, when I do this training live, many people will say, it's a talk about the birds and the bees, or it's a talk about how to be safe. It's a talk about um, uh, 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 other issues that may come up uh, as you have this discussion about sex, but rarely do we talk about it from the standpoint of uh, consent, and that's really important. So uh, let's talk about it in terms of why we have the talk, um, and what is sexual misconduct? Well, just know that for 85,000 faculty, staff, and students, I, in my um, office, conducts every single one of the investigations that relates to discrimination and harassment, right? So if someone, for whatever reason, um, believes that their race or their religion or um, uh, the, uh, their sexual orientation um, the fact they speak with an accent. Any of those things um, uh, that serve as a protected class, right? Just imagine it's something that you cannot change about yourself. And it's used to determine your grade or whether or not you are eligible um, for a job um, or something to that effect if you're being discriminated against or being harassed because of something that you cannot change about yourself that thing we call a protected classification, then my office handles those complaints um, for every single faculty, staff, and student within the University of Houston system. So imagine we do this for University of Houston downtown, Clear Lake, Victoria, main campus, and also study abroad programs, anywhere we have affiliations. If those issues come up, um, they come to my office. And it's not just me. Um, I have five lawyers that work for me. I'm also a lawyer. Um, and so uh, uh, we take these very seriously. Now, you may be asking, well, what does that have to do with sexual misconduct? Well, I want you to imagine if your partner put hands on you on Tuesday, what's the likelihood that you would go to class on Wednesday? If you were sexually assaulted over the weekend, what's the likelihood that you're going to make it back to class the following week? Right? So we look at these things as being gender motivated, right? And also, they're extreme forms of sexual harassment, right? Sexual harassment are activities that are sexual in nature and unwanted, right? Or imagine um, uh, if you're being stalked by somebody that wants to have a relationship with you and you don't want to have a relationship with them, and it's interfering with your ability to pursue an educational opportunity. We call all those activities sexual misconduct. So. Let's talk about the sexual misconduct policy. Key facts about the policy is that it covers faculty, staff, students, and visitors. 
Um, what that basically means is uh, uh, while some other institutions have several different policies that cover uh, sexual misconduct, we have one. It makes it very easy for you to find out what your rights are under the policy because there's only one policy and it's called the sexual misconduct policy. Just in case you're interested in seeing it, you can go to any University of Houston um, webpage, look at the bottom of the page, it'll say Title IX sexual misconduct in a link, look there on the right and that link will take you to the web page that has my information. If you look on the left, it'll say policies, and that's where you'll find the sexual misconduct policy. You also find the policy for discrimination and harassment as well. Anyhow, just know that if you're a faculty, staff, or student, or a visitor on campus, that policy covers you. Also, uh, it covers behavior that occurs on and off campus. So if you are uh, stalked uh, by a classmate on campus or if you try to go to the library and there's someone there that is um, uh, 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 saying things that are of a sexual in nature, um, cat calling you is uh, uh, one way to describe that activity and um, you feel like you know what I can no longer go to the library because that's occurring. Of course that is behavior that would be covered under the policy but I want you to also to imagine that if your partner who's also a student or an employee um, uh, 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 batters you or um, commits some act of violence or any behavior that's covered under the sexual misconduct policy, um, that behavior could also be covered because what's the likelihood that that's going to have some impact on class tomorrow when both of you arrive on campus, right? So it covers not only on-campus behavior but also off-campus behavior. Another way to think of it too is what about a study abroad program in Italy? If uh, uh, a student uh, uh, harasses you or commits some act of sexual misconduct in, in, in Italy, um, does it, uh, 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 is it covered under the sexual misconduct policy? And the answer would be yes. The third point that I just put up is that there's no time limit to report or file a complaint. Um, here's the reason why. Uh, we've been doing this for a while, and, um, and, I, and I know the reason why we added every single provision. And this provision was a big deal because um, uh, you have to imagine when people um, have these events occur to them, sometimes they're just not ready to report. So we wanted to create a trauma-informed policy that basically says, even though something happened to you and it's covered under the policy, when you're ready to move forward, you can move forward. That could be tomorrow. That could be 10 years from now. Just know there's no time limit. There's no statute of limitations to file a complaint with our office or internal to the university. Now keep in mind that you can also file a criminal complaint. So there's two processes you could go through. The internal process is different from the criminal process. At the end of a criminal process, someone could go to jail. It is a criminal complaint that you're filing with the police department in the district attorney's office. With us, this would be considered an internal complaint, kind of like a civil complaint. So what they will be determined in a criminal complaint is whether or not your freedom is going to be taken away, or that part of the assaulter's freedom is going to be taken away, whether they're going to be prosecuted and convicted criminally. And what we determine is whether or not the faculty, staff, or a student who did wrong or violated the policy is going to remain a faculty, staff, or student. Right? They may be expelled. They may be fired etc. Right? So um, keep in mind that for us, the internal process, there is no time limit. Whenever you're ready to report, whenever you're ready to get help, we're ready to help you. It also provides equal rights to both parties involved, which means basically uh, that um, uh, if you are, you have the right to pursue a complaint and the person who is accused has a right to defend themselves. Both have a right to present evidence. It's not just a one-sided uh, investigation. It's an investigation that considers the, um, the evidence of both parties. So know that uh, um, you have uh, uh, an opportunity to actually participate in the process if you're accused um, and you also have the right to engage the process if uh, um, you're the accuser. Um, so both parties get to participate. Making a report doesn't automatically start the formal uh, process, which means uh, when you come to us and say, hey, look, this happened to me, um, I just need an accommodation. I just need to move classrooms would be an example of an accommodation. Uh, I just want a no contact order, meaning I don't want the person to contact me. So when I go to the rec, I don't have to worry about them um, waiting for me there, or following me to a machine, um, and contacting me. I just want them to leave me alone. 
Um, so know that there are accommodations that we could provide. Um, we call them interim measures under the policy uh, 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 before we launch an investigation. And we will absolutely consider um, uh, uh, the, the victim or the reporter's um, wishes uh, whether or not we proceed or not. And next, when consent is not present, the policy is implicated. What does consent look like? Well, if you look here, and we, we'll go over this really quickly, um, here's the definition of consent. Consent is an informed and freely af and affirmatively communicated willingness to participate in a particular sexual activity. Consent can be expressed either by words or clear, unambiguous actions. Consent is not passive and cannot be inferred from the absence of no. That's pretty important, right? So just because a person didn't say no doesn't mean that you have consent. In fact, um, by reading that definition, affirmatively communi communicated, that's a hint to you that this is an affirmative consent policy, meaning you have to get the yes before you get the no. I have some examples of that in just a second. Consent must be present throughout the sexual activity. So if during the sexual activity, consent is withdrawn, um, and that consent, that withdrawal, uh, that uh, um, um, uh, uh, taking back of consent could look a variety of ways. So they could be communicated to you, it could be uh, indicated in that person's um, uh, 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 withdrawal in other ways, her uh, or his um, appearance um, that they've withdrawn, that's something that you need um, to recognize and stop the activity immediately. Um, a person is unable to consent if the person is mentally or physically incapacitated due to the influence of drugs, alcohol, and medication. Incapacitation um, is not knowing the who, what, when, where, or why of a situation because of drugs, alcohol, or some other uh, mental incapacitation. Right? So uh, um, that's something that you need to consider. If you knew or should have known, you need to stop. If, that, if you knew that person is or you knew that person had been drinking heavily, uh, slurring their speech, so on and so forth, those are all things that indicate that they're incapacitated. Uh, also, the existence of a dating relationship or previous sexual relationship between the persons involved does not provide a basis for an assumption of consent. So just because you had sex with the person last week um, or uh, participated in an activity um, uh, you know, an hour before, it does not mean that you have consent to participate in that activity um, you know, uh, at that moment. So you need to get con uh, consent um, every single time. And one way to uh, kind of provide a visual, uh, just imagine if I walked up to you and I had stacks of money in my back pocket and I look at you, smile, then look at my back pocket with all that money. I look back at you, smile, and look at back at the uh, money in my pocket. Um, ask yourself, did I give you permission to take that money out of my pocket. Now most of you, because you understand the context of the training, would think, no. Well, keep in mind, I've been doing this for a long time, and every single time that I investigate one of these cases, um, you know, the accused person has rights under the policy, and I'll ask that person uh, to, to tell me why did they think they had permission or had consent to participate in that sexual activity. And um, there are a lot of responses that I get back. Um, that person didn't say no. There's all kinds of responses. But the number one response that I get back is that I got the look. So the reason why I thought I had consent is because the person looked like they wanted me to, uh, uh, to engage in the activity with them. And what I'm telling you is possibly, maybe, but I want you to be sure. I want you to feel that you have been given permission, you have been given an affirmative uh, yes. And the way that you know that you have been given the affirmative yes is by asking, may I do this? May I kiss you? Um, you know, can we participate in this activity? And I know that uh, uh, that may be an issue. And when I do this pre presentation live, I will, you know, uh, ask folks, uh, I get it. Um, you're afraid to ask this question, may I do this? Because it may kill the mood. It may stop the activity, and I don't want to do that. And I'm letting you know um, that sexual assault will kill the mood. And not only will it kill the mood, I want you to imagine prison. Um, this isn't anything that you want to take lightly. Um, make sure that you have affirmative consent. Um, also, here's another way of looking at this. Um, 
uh, and forgive me, this is a little crude, but um, it, it uh, uh, helps us look at it from a different perspective. Um, you know, people uh, sometimes compare sexual activities to baseball. They'll say, you know, yesterday I got to second base. Um, I got to third base and I was headed home and then I was sent back to first base. Uh, well, I'll ask the question, well, how do you know you had permission to go to all those bases? And then the person will say, well, as soon as um, the individual told me no, I stopped. No means no. That's what I've been told. So let's go back to this example of the, of the wallet, right? So in the wallet situation, at what point in time, if the person took the wallet out of my back pocket, would it be considered a theft if I did not give them permission to take the money out of my pocket? Hopefully you're answering as soon as the person took the wallet out of the pocket. As soon as they did that, that's a theft, right? Well, if that's the case, then when did the sexual assault occur in this baseball example? Well, as soon as the person touched the base, not when the person said no, but as soon as they touched the base, right? Um, so to protect everyone and to make everyone safe, we ask before you even get to the base that you ask the question, right? Can we do this? Do you want to do this? Is this okay? Right? So make sure you get the yes before you get the no. Now, um, I have to tell you that uh, I didn't get to this point overnight. Regardless, I, 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 I uh, have conducted a lot of investigations. I present on Title IX across the country. I know that this is uh, a work that, uh, um, uh, that I do well. But I, I always remember the very first case that I got. And the very first case that I got, um, because these cases are often criminal cases, I remember reading the criminal file or the investigative file from the police department. And uh, um, because I handle so many discrimination cases, you have to imagine if someone says, I'm not going to provide you uh, equal opportunity. I'm not going to give you the grade you deserve or the job that you earned or the promotion that you should get because of who you love, because of the God you pray to, because you have an accent, because of the color of your skin, that when people come in my office, usually they're a little upset. They're a little disappointed. They're frustrated. How unfair is it that I was denied an opportunity because of something I can't change about myself? Well, when I got my very first sexual assault case, um, I remember reading the file and in the file, um, the uh, victim uh, survivor was stating that during the, the sexual assault, she was texting H-E-P, H-E-P, H-E-P. And I knew that what she was texting to her boyfriend at the time was help. I knew that. But when I met the young lady, um, she spent the initial parts of our interview basically saying, I did not want to do this. I did not give him permission. I didn't consent. And you know this because I was texting ATP, ATP, ATP. I meant to put help. I meant to put help. And her response and her reaction really was different to me. It wasn't one of frustration. It wasn't one of anger. It was one of, do you believe me? So as I continue to um, ask her questions, um, she described for me that she scratched the individual. I scratched him. I scratched him on his face. There's photos. You can see it. So I looked at the photos. And I remember um, that uh, uh, the scratch was very similar to the scratch in this picture, which was on, the, on that person's back uh, and not on their face, as she had described. And I didn't know why. As an investigator, I'm trying to figure this out. I'm a lawyer. I'm smart. I, I should be able to you know, come up with a decision on this. And I really couldn't. It was very difficult. And I realized um, that what I needed to do was stop and think about, well, what would I do if I had been sexually assaulted? What would I do if I was in that situation? And I thought I probably would pry, try to repress that memory as best as I possibly could. I probably wouldn't be thinking sequentially. I probably would, as a result of the trauma, have a difficult time talking about this particular issue. And honestly, I probably would try to survive this with the least amount of violence as possible. These are very, 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 very difficult cases to investigate. So the best thing that we can do is, tr is to have a policy um, that uh, allows for the victim survivor to get help, to get interim measures, to get a no contact order, um, to approach this uh, in a trauma-informed way. Um, so when you're ready, we're ready to help you. 
Um, and we want to make sure that if you want to file a complaint against that person, that there's a process in place that allows you to do that. I also want you to keep in mind that it's not only uh, women that are victims of sexual assault. Now, while we don't get many reports of men filing complaints of sexual assaults, we do know that it happens, and we do receive some complaint from, from men. Um, surprisingly, uh, we don't uh, get a, 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 a lot of complaints from men, but we do get a lot of uh, reports from men reporting domestic and dating violence, mainly dating violence, right? So dating violence is, uh, it will, domestic and dating violence are both uh, considered uh, um, uh, uh, violence between couples, uh, whether current or former, or violence between individuals that have a common child. Right? So if, if uh, uh, someone you have a common child with, even if the dating relationship, if there was ever one, um, may be over, um, it's, that activity is still something that's covered under uh, the sexual misconduct policy. I also want to present that um, intimate partner violence does not discriminate, which means it doesn't matter what your sexual orientation is. Right? Um, University of Houston uh, um, protects as, as a protected class under our policy. Um, person, sexual orientations, also gender identity and gender expression, right? So none of those issues uh, prevent you from um, processing your complaint under the policy, and we hope you do contact us. Again, uh, if you only want accommodations, that's fine, um, but allow us the opportunity to, uh, to help you. Now, stalking is a repeated communication and attention um, that uh, uh, creates an emotional distress. Now remember, this is under the sexual misconduct policy, so it's repeated communication for that purpose, right? Of someone trying to pursue a dating relationship or, uh, or something to that effect that creates emotional distress. Also keep in mind that that communication doesn't have to be to you directly, it could be to a family member. Um, it's just repeated and um, it's the kind of communication that would create an emotional um, uh, distress from you. If that's occurring, every time you log into your class, someone's requesting dates or is pursuing you in such a way that you feel like you're being stalked, um, please let us know. Uh, also keep in mind that uh, alcohol, at least in our sexual misconduct, I'm sorry, sexual assault cases especially, um, is, is usually a factor, right? Um, but incapacitation isn't just, isn't typically just, I'm, I'm buzzing, right? It's, I'm, I'm so drunk, I do not know um, the who, what, when, where, why, or um, I'm under the influence of a drug, or for whatever reason, um, you do not know um, what is going on around you, right? Um, but here's, it's, here's, here's a common um, uh, response. A common response is that, well, I was also drunk, um, says the accused. Well, know that what an investigation looks like is me going to the party or talking to people that were there um, if there was an activity that preceded the assault or domestic violence or stalking. And I'm going to ask, well, how was this person acting? Well, this person had been drinking and was falling down, throwing up, uh, 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 didn't know people's name. Um, it looked like that person was incapacitated. That's the kind of evidence that I'm going to consider, right? I'm also going to ask about uh, the accused. Right? Well, how was that person acting? And if I get a response back such as that person was drinking, but that person um, seemed to be okay. Um, uh, communicating fine, um, wasn't falling down, that I could tell. Um, that's also evidence that I'm going to use in my investigation, right? I'm also going to ask the question of you or the accused. I'm going to ask, you know, so did you drive yesterday? Yep, I drove. Okay, you, you were able to drive. Well, where did y'all go? Um, my apartment, where you knew where you lived. Um, and I heard that person was calling you a name that wasn't yours. That's correct. Okay, well, under the policy, if you knew or should have known um, that the person was incapacitated, such as you knew that person was calling you a name that wasn't yours, then that's evidence, again, that I'm going to use under the policy, right? So what's important is that we don't take advantage of people. That's not what cougs do. Cougs take care of people. We don't take advantage of them. Um, if anything, get them help. And that goes to the next idea, which is um, many times uh, uh, 
uh, we get information that the um, activity um, may have been induced by uh, some date rape drug or, or something to that effect. And um, it's important that, that uh, one prevention strategy is um, that we take care of each other. When we go out, if we say something like that, please let the person know if you see something being put in someone's drink or, or uh, um, you know, there's various plans that people um, implement when they go out with their friends, right? Um, but what if your friend is the one that's putting something in the drink? I hope that you step in. I hope you prevent that from occurring. That's what Coogs Get Consent is all about. Coogs Get Consent is about us taking care of each other. Um, we have to do that, right? You're not going to be thinking about this training um, uh, when you're out having a good time. But I hope you're thinking about taking care of your friends, uh, not just the ones that may be victims, um, but the ones that may also be perpetrators, right? And there's a way that you can do that. If you see a coog in distress, you know, help them out, step in, even if they're the ones about to um, commit the bad act, right? And there's three ways you could do that. You can intervene by stopping them directly, right? Or telling them directly. So you go to the library and someone's saying something disgusting, say, hey, stop saying that. That's not cool. Why are you saying that? Say something. Say it to them directly. But I want you to do it in a safe way. I don't want you to do it and then um, escalate the, the situation where it gets violent. Just do it in a way that you feel comfortable. Distract them. So the distraction could be, hey, before they give the drink to someone, uh, hey, uh, check out this video. Check out these pictures on Instagram. Oh, you're not going to believe the Twitter post I just got from so-and-so. Or let's go to another party. Let's do something different. Make sure that you, you know, are presenting them with an idea that you think will stop the activity, distract them enough um, that uh, maybe um, another friend can go to the uh, 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 unsuspecting person um, uh, and do the same or inform them or something to that effect. But distraction is a good way uh, to get per the person off the task that may put themselves in someone else uh, in harm's way. And then the last thing to do is, uh, is to delegate. What I mean by delegating, you know what, if you're in the, if the, you're in the residence halls, go get an RA, a resident advisor. Um, if you're at a club, maybe uh, the bar owner or the club owner or security or someone, go get them. Uh, you know, uh, if someone's in distress, call 911. Just don't leave that person um, to figure it out on their own or possibly um, navigate what could be a horrible event um, for them by themselves. Coogs take care of coogs. I need you to take care of your friends. Now. There's other ways to step in. I want you to take a look at this list of things that you can consider. Oops, let me go back and put that on the screen. Usually at this point when I do this training live, I have someone come up and actually intervene. It's kind of uncomfortable, you know? It's kind of difficult at first for them to do it. But then what I get them to visualize is this. I want you to imagine your friend giving someone a bad drink and you not stepping in. Number one, that's an assault. That's a crime. That's a violation of the policy. But being kicked out of school is the least of their worries. I want you to imagine your friend doing 10, 15 years in prison, right? How horrible would that be when both of you were dreaming about whatever you were going to do with your education? So step in. Even though it may be uncomfortable, so long as you can do it safely, stop them from ruining their life. Right now, the other reason and the most important reason is think about that victim. Think about the other person, the classmate who is is uh, uh, is now assaulted, victimized by your friend. Right uh, now, that person is being denied an educational opportunity. That person may not be in class tomorrow. Let's prevent them from having the worst memory um, that anyone can ever have. I know this kind of trivializes the, the activity, but I want you to imagine if you've ever lost something and you thought someone stole it, that someone stole your phone, right? How angry you were. I can't believe somebody took my phone. It's not theirs. Why would they take it? Now imagine if someone stole something from your body, right? If someone took your phone, you probably weren't there. 
But imagine with an assault or domestic violence, that's something that they're personally there to experience and they can't get rid of that memory, right? So it's really important. The best way that we can address it is to make sure that we step in when we see this happening and to also make sure you get the yes, make sure you have permission before you get the no, right? Moving on to this next slide. Oops, I'm sorry, I keep moving too fast. Um, assess the situation, assess your comfort and ability, and assess your, assess your safety. I don't want you to do anything that puts you um, in harm's way, so um, make sure that, uh, that you think about what you do before you do it. But if you have yeses on all those, yes, this is the right situation, I'm comfortable, I can do this, this is my good friend, I know they'll understand it, um, and I think I can do this safely, I hope that you do. Lastly is you cannot consent if you're unconscious. If the person is not conscious, that person cannot consent. Get that person some help. Uh, don't leave them uh, alone uh, for someone else to possibly take advantage of them. Um, you gotta be uh, conscious in order to consent to an activity. So what does consent look like? It looks like this. Um, you have the yes. Yes, you can go to first base. Yes, you can go to second, etc. cetera. Um, keep that in mind. There's one thing that we didn't talk about, which is sexual exploitation. That's important. Um, think about it this way. Do you have permission to take photos of that person? Now, that person may have sent you photos that are sexually suggestive. Do you have permission to forward those photos to someone else? If you don't, then you can't forward it, right? Um, also, uh, uh, if you have um, uh, an STI um, or HIV, um, uh, something to that effect, um, that's something that you have to disclose. Um, to, to the person that you want to have sex with. If you do not, that's something that would be covered under the sexual exploitation provision in the policy, right? So take a look at the policy so you have a better understanding of the provisions. Um, also, um, there's places that you can get help, right? Number one, you can call the police. Like I said, these things are crimes. You can file a criminal complaint. Oftentimes, these things are crimes. Um, sexual assault, domestic and dating violence, stalking absolutely are crimes. Um, you can have a safety plan, like I just don't feel safe, I need someone to escort me uh, from uh, uh, my class to my car, that's something they can help you with. They can also help you with filing a protective order um, with the district attorney's office. So uh, call the uh, uh, police department, I believe the number is 33333 on campus. Um, make sure that uh, you give them a call if this is something that you are wanting. You may also contact our office. You can file an internal complaint, get accommodations, no contact order. You know, we can discuss your, your options. There's also others that we can refer you to. We can refer you to counseling and psychological services, um, the health center. Also, there is a um, sexual uh, uh, misconduct support services person on campus through the Women and Gender Resource Center. That's also been a, a, a great resource, and she is also a confidential resource. Uh, and that uh, is uh, what this slide is all about. If you want to get more information about our campaign dealing with this issue, um, UHSSalutations.com is a great informative website. There are going to be a variety of other websites um, uh, that uh, um, are a result of not only um, the administration taking this seriously, but also student organizations as well. I hope you get involved. This is a topic that's important to you. Um, just make sure that if you have any questions or have any concerns, if you want to report, please give us a call. My number is 713-743-8835 is the general number, and there are others that could uh, receive a call. Um, my direct line, though, is 713-743-8834. Uh, uh, as a Title IX coordinator, I'm available um, uh, to any of you if you have any questions or concerns. All right, so that is our presentation. Remember, Cougs take care of Cougs. I know you want to do the right thing. Um, and uh, uh, one way that you can do that is stay engaged. Um, whenever you see this symbol somewhere, um, recognize that it's all of our responsibilities. It's not just um, the Title IX coordinators, meaning me, or people who talk about this all the time. It's you. Absolutely you, because you're the one that could stop this activity from occurring. Only you can do that. All right. Thank you very much, and I hope you have uh, um, 
a wonderful rest of the orientation. And since this is orientation, I want to welcome you to the University of Houston. Good luck.